Welcome to the Clarion West Summer Craft Talk Series. This year, in the absence of a six-week workshop, we've asked our instructors to prepare a craft talk for our students and write-a-thon participants. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Tina Connolly and Carolyn Yoakum. The author of a fantasy trilogy, a YA series, and a collection of short stories, Tina Connolly's fantastic worlds are populated with witches, the fae, and the occasional flying banana. As a narrator, she's performed stories for numerous podcasts, including her own, the Parsec award-winning Toasted Cake. Her work has been nominated for the Nebula, Norton, Locus, and World Fantasy Awards. With over 100 short stories to her name, Carolyn Yoakum has been a finalist for the Hugo, World Fantasy, Locus, and multiple Nebula Awards. Carolyn is a master of flash fiction, though her work at any length holds lasting emotional resonance, whether woven with a touch of whimsy or a twist of darkness. The duo met while attending Clarion West in 2006 and have written multiple stories together. Watching Tina and Carolyn discuss, discuss anything is a treat, and we readers benefit from the magic of their collaboration as it spills onto the pages they write, both individually and collectively. We are happy to have you with us tonight, Carolyn and Tina. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Uh, we're very excited to be here. Uh, so Carolyn and I were trying to figure out what we wanted to talk about tonight. And one of the things that we both like to write a lot and have in fact collaborated on in the past is flash fiction. So we thought we would talk about um, some of our sort of tricks and tips for getting into flash fiction and getting in, getting out, getting it done. So kind of we were trying to figure out how to structure it and we decided that, you know, one thing that flash can do really well is that it can do one thing really well. And that is a big overgeneralization, but what I mean by that is that it's kind of a great place to sort of say, I'm going to take one specific thing and focus on it in this very, very little short story. So it can be a really great way from a craft perspective to sort of think about one particular thing. Um, so we thought that we would arrange this talk by looking at some of those sort of key one things that you might build your story around. And some of our points, we have six of them, um, might help you figure out how to start a story. They might help you when you're in the story. Um, but they're all sort of six focal points that you might use to think about your flash. We also have some examples to share with you. So I just wanted to reassure you from the beginning, you don't have to take notes. We will post the list of all our examples in the write-a-thon Slack after the talk is over. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn to talk about our first section. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about um, how to highlight ideas in a flash fiction story. Um, but before I do that, I want to build a little bit on Tina's um, introduction that she did to say that I encourage even people who wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as the Flash writer to try out writing Flash um, for a couple of reasons. One is that it's such a short exercise that you can um, really work on a skill that you want to work on or experiment without having to devote a lot of time to it. Um, and then the other thing that you can really um, do well with Flash is that you can build skills that you can transfer into longer work. So for me, my natural length is Flash. And um, it was hard for me to write longer stories. And one of the ways that I did that was to start thinking of Flash stories as being scenes or building blocks. Um, that I could use to create something longer. Um, and Tina's going to talk about this more when we get to the section on structure. Um, but we, um, we've talked about this technique, Tina and I, before as being called flash mash, where we just mash a lot of things together to build something bigger. Um, but in terms of elements um, that you can focus on in a flash story, uh, the one that I wanted to talk about first is um, idea. Um, and what I mean by idea is, is this sort of abstract concept. So who gets to be a hero or what happens after death? 
Uh, you can examine free will or consciousness or the way that the power can corrupts or the concept of privacy, that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to switch the view here because I've gotten a weird visual thing on the video. Sorry about that. Um, so um, a really good place to go if you're looking for examples of idea stories is Nature Futures, um, which is sort of a very short flash fiction piece that is at the end of um, each issue of Nature Magazine. Um, and you could go through and look at a lot of those. So I'm going to talk about one example in particular of a flash fiction story that focuses on idea, uh, which is what's expected of us by Ted Chang. Uh, Ted Chang obviously is really good at dissecting an idea in both short form and in longer stories. And um, one of the things to think about if you're really an idea-driven writer is how to take an abstract concept, like a big abstract idea, and try to fit it into a short amount of space. Um, one of the things that you can do is to sort of choose your starting point really carefully. Uh, people, when they come to a story, can uh, sort of take the first thing as a given. You kind of get one freebie at the beginning as the sort of starting premise that you're going to work from. And so you might establish a world where nothing is private to examine the idea of privacy, or you might establish a world where, um, you know, power is temporary and see how that plays out in the story. But you can kind of start with one assumption that can be almost anything. It can be way off the wall and people will go with it because that's the starting premise of the story. Um, Another thing when you're, when you're working on a story that highlights idea is to really think of an application rather than keeping everything vague. You want to ground it in specifics. So in the Ted Chang story that I mentioned, What's Expected of Us, uh, the application is a gadget. It's a little device and it is uh, basically a button and a light and the light comes on a second before you push the button. And this device is a way to examine the notion of free will and how people respond to a device that always, inevitably, lights up one second before you push the button, which sort of indicates that free will is not something that, that people have. Um, and, what, and the story sort of spins out from there. But it's a really specific, concrete example um, of an application that, that tests the idea. Um, so the other thing that you can do since Flash is so short is to really adjust the other elements in your story. So things like the characters, the world building, to highlight the idea. So um, one of the things you can do is pick a perspective, a character that will let you um, look at an idea in a, in a new way. So um, I'm actually going to talk about perspective in more detail later. Um, but the other thing to do is to sometimes minimize some of the el other elements. So if you have a really complex, convoluted idea, uh, one of the things that you can do is to um, simplify your plot arc or your characters. So the Ted Chang story that I was talking about, the characters are not highly developed characters. Instead, they are very vague and, um, you know, sort of people in general play with this device rather than having a specific character because the idea is the focus and that's the more complex part. Um, but it is still important, even if you're not having sort of a strong character arc in the story, to have something in the story change. Um, so sometimes what that is going to be is rather than having the character come to a realization or change in some, uh, change their perspective, the reader might have an aha sort of moment where they see the idea in a new light, that sort of thing. Um, so one of the things that Tina and I will both be re returning to as we go through different elements you can highlight in a flash fiction story is um, how, how to make a satisfying story arc, how to have something change. So Tina is going to tell us next about how that might work for characters. Yes. So one of the things, oh, and first I want to apologize about the terrible lag on my video. I'm so sorry. I keep just, I'm trying to fiddle with it, but I'm going to have to deal with it. Anyway, one of the things that Carolyn and I uh, keep coming back to when we teach is that we both come at story from two entirely different perspectives. She often gets in from an idea or a theme and I often start from a character. And 
if you if you know or if you have a sense of what is more intuitive to you that can help you when you're trying to figure out how to get into a story so given that if i'm getting into a flash story from character then things i might be looking at there are the set are the, first of all that a flash story focused on character is likely to focus on like one key turning point for your protagonist a single choice that they make you don't have the room necessarily that you would in a longer story or novel to build up lots of little changes as someone inches toward a long big decision so you really have to narrow in and focus on one tiny moment of change um, now that also means that again if you're focusing on character you might make other things more simple in order to focus on that so if you need if it's a you have a complicated world building thing where someone has to choose between you know the being the savior of the the ruth and Kana of the ruby of you know the, if you we don't have a lot of room for world world building so you have to have a simple thing that's perhaps following expectations versus staying true to yourself, something that is more immediately relatable because you only have 750,000 words to do it. One example I pulled to, to look at for this is a story by Jose Pablo Iriarte that was in Daily SF called Heart Stitch. And in it, this story focuses on one single moment of change. We have a person who's used to helping others and the story looks at the one moment where uh, the protagonist meets someone who can help them heal, who can help them uh, uh, do what this character has always been doing for other people. So uh, Iriarty takes a really good look at that single turning point of change for the character and really manages to focus it down in a very short window of time. So Carolyn, I'm going to give it back to you to talk about perspective as our next step. So one of the things that's really interesting with, um, with flash fiction stories and talking to Tina about the way that we interpret fiction is that irrespective of what your process is as a writer or your intention is as a writer, people are going to draw different things from different stories. Um, so often what Tina will see as a character story, I will actually view as more of a perspective on an idea. So I'll go back to the example that Tina just used, um, which is um, heart, heart stitches. And um, for me, what sticks with me about that story is more the abstract ideas of how we heal, how we interact with other people, how we deal with pain. Um, and the strength of the story is the way that the character's perspective actually illuminates those bigger more abstract ideas so for tina it's very much a character arc story where the character has come to terms with something very specific but that's just not the way that i approach the fiction as a reader which is um, interesting because it parallels our approach as writers so if you're trying to figure out your own process one of the things that you can look at is when you're reading stories what is it that connects with you and resonates with you how do you process the fiction um, as opposed to um, you know different people are going to draw different things based on their experiences and and the way their mind tries to pick the story apart. So um, it's been really interesting over the years talking to Tina about things because often, you know, we'll start talking and we'll realize we took completely different things from stories. We're starting from completely different places as we write stories. Um, and I think it works really well for us to teach together because then everybody gets a really broad range of perspective on, you know, things that you might try that might or might not work for you depending on where you're coming from. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit more about perspective, which is kind of my version of character. Um, <clears throat> for me, choosing the right perspective can really help focus the abstract idea. One of the biggest challenges for me as a writer is trying to figure out how to take this really vast idea with all these parts and pieces and bring it down to a manageable level so that I can get it on the page. Um, and so if I want to look at, say, gentrification, which is like sort of this big abstract thing, um, I might decide I want to create a world with a sentient city. And I might decide that that's still too much to fit in a flash fiction story. So I might decide to tell the story from the perspective of a single sentient garbage truck going through the city. Um, and then it becomes small enough that I can fit 
that portion of the idea into a flash story. Um, and it also, it, it also gives a way to sort of give people a different, a different look at it that's maybe more distanced from reality, which can sometimes help people see an idea in a different way. Sometimes if you're so entangled in the reality of something and there, there's maybe a lot of baggage that comes with something, having a really off the wall perspective can give you the distance that you need to see the idea in a different way. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of stories that I think use perspective really well. Uh, the first one is a Jennifer Marie Brissett story, uh, which is called, um, I am terrible at remembering titles, which is why I write these things down, which is called Breathe Deep, Breathe Free, uh, which originally appeared in People of Color Destroy Science Fiction uh, all the way back in 2016. Uh, it is told from the perspective of two young people who are texting back and forth in the middle of a big environmental disaster, but it grapples with a lot of big picture issues about syst systemic racism uh, that are so, so relevant right now. Uh, so it was originally in People of Color Destroy Science Fiction, which is um, now available actually online to download uh, for free, but also uh, it's on the author's website, on, on Jennifer Marie Brissett's website. And I do feel like it is a story that does a particularly good job of using perspective to really bring out um, a lot of big abstract concepts. Um, another, another good example of this um, is Ken Liu's Memories of My Mother, uh, which was in daily science fiction. Uh, and so there it is a story that really just sort of looks at time dilation in a lot of ways, but it brings it down to a very personal level. It gives it an emotional impact because it brings it down to the level of two characters and their specific relationship. So um, I think that one of the things, if you are an idea writer to think about, an idea driven writer to think about is, you know, what perspectives can you use? How can you use that tool to bring the story down to a more personal level and help people connect with it? Um, and in particular, it can help character-driven writers or readers connect with the story if you can bring it down to that personal level. Um, so um, now I will turn it over to Tina again and she will talk about voice. <laughs> yeah, um, and I want to bring back to the, the garbage truck example for a moment too because um, as Carolyn said, coming into this from ideas, she might say, all right, what is the best way to tell a story about gentrification? And then she narrows it down and finds that sentient garbage truck. Whereas I have always said, like, if someone said, write a story about gentrification, I'd be like, uh, and I just kind of flounder. I don't, I don't automatically know where to start. Not that Carolyn does, but you know, that not that anybody does. Writing is hard. But, um, but if somebody says, write a story about a sentient garbage truck, that is much more like, I have a way in. And then I start thinking about gentrification and then it spells out from there. So it's just, we end up, we could end up with a very similar story, just approaching it from two entirely different angles as you trick your brain into writing words, which is really what this is all about. Um, so voice is really interesting to me, uh, both, both as a finished piece and as a way to get into the story. Uh, that's the story that Carolyn mentioned by uh, Jen Brissett is, is really has a very powerful voice, a very unique voice in it with the two teenagers texting. And it, it's very memorable to the finished product and, and really gets its impact across. Um, but voice can be a really strong, way, very good way for you, the writer, as a tool to get into the story. Um, if, for example, if you're going to tell a story in invented future slang, or uh, I have a theater background, so a lot of times I think of, you might think of something as a monologue, for example, a, a monologue from a person with a very unique way of speaking, someone who's a teenager, someone who's in an altered state, someone who's an alien, you know, any, any kind of thing might be a way to help you get into a story. Uh, one of the examples I, used, I like to use for this one a lot when I'm teaching is there's a really fantastic story that many of you may have read uh, that was in the New Yorker a long time ago uh, by Jamaica Kincaid called Girl. And it's an extremely short story where in the entire, the entire story is one sentence. It is just a string of semicolons of things, of statements strung, strung together that are critical statements a mother is making to her daughter, basically. And it builds up this very powerful image of what the daughter's life is like, just hearing this, this endless, and I say critical, but they're also, you know, they're, they're, 
they're more than that. They're, you know, it's, it's full of everything the mother wants for the daughter, everything that the mother wants to warn the daughter about, everything the mother wants to help the daughter about. So it builds up this very powerful story in just like 300, 400 short words of monologue. Um, so if, if you're someone who says uh, characters often come to me and start talking in my head, this can, voice can be a useful tool to get into a unique story with. And it's also it's the sort of thing where Flash is very suited to a very strong voice because it can be hard to sustain um, something with an extremely strong voice over the course of, say, 70,000 words. So Flash might be a really great way to, to do something very interesting. Carolyn and I were both separately watching uh, Sunday in the Park with George recently, which, which uh, is about the painter Georges Seurat and coinalism. And there's this point where Sondheim is going like, red, 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 blue, 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 blue. And you can, you know, you can see he's using language in a wholly different way to build up this, this new story. Um, other forms you might try, you know, a strong lyrical voice, uh, stories that have poems in it or songs, being playful with language itself is a way in. Another story uh, that really that I'd like to talk about for this one too is a story that ran in Uncanny by Bogi Tokash, which, is, which was called uh, The Size of a Barley Corn Encased in Lead. And it is written, it is a story that's set perhaps in the future and it feels that it's it's it seems to be mixing sort of multiple sources like it's a found object story so it deliberately mixes sort of this religious uh, religious text and scientific instruction all together and so uh Chokash is very deliberately using uh, these two very familiar sort of stylistic devices. We can tell that a religious a religious guide has a very different stylistic feel than a technical instruction manual. And so that deliberate mixing there, uh, they found a very powerful way to make this new sort of story come across. And that's, it's a really interesting and exciting and powerful story to me because it uses those two sorts of forms to really unique effect, mix them together. Uh, so yeah, voice is something I, I really, I really love playing with and it's, it's, it, it's a fun one for me and it can be really unique and uh, make a really big impact as a finished object as well. And now I'm going to throw it back to Carolyn to talk about our next section, which is world building in a tight space. Um, so obviously with Flash, you're doing everything in a tight space, but one of the things that can be a little bit more challenging sometimes is to get that world building in because sometimes you've imagined this really wonderful world and it's got a lot of cool details and all of these other things and how do you get that across in very small space? Um, I think there are a lot of sort of tips and tricks that you can use for it. Uh, one of the things that I have to remind myself a lot is to sort of trust the reader because the reader will bring in a lot of knowledge to the piece. Um, and so sometimes you can save yourself a lot of space or a lot of words by um, starting from something you think your audience in general will know. So one story that does this is there's a story by Greg Van Eekhout called Big Box. Um, and what it does is it builds on people's experience of those sort of big box stores where you can go and buy everything. Um, and instead of having to build up the whole world from scratch, it focuses on just a store with some very different um, items to purchase and prices for those items. And so instead of having to set up the entire world, you can just make one small change and then rely on your reader's knowledge. Now, obviously there's gonna be pitfalls with that because a reader's background may not be your background. You can't necessarily know what any given reader is going to bring to a story. But at the same time, there are some types of details that are definitely going to be unique to your world and very evocative. Um, and often for flash fiction, you can rely on those and just sort of um, hope that the readers will bring a lot of their own experience in to fill in the blanks for you. Um, and it may be that their experience of the story is not quite what you intended to convey. Um, you know, as people read things, no two readers are going to bring the same background to the story. Um, so it's kind of this balancing act of not over explaining everything to try to dictate their experience, but also to try to guide people in terms of the ideas you want people to focus on. Um, and so um, 
one of the things I talked about before when I was talking about idea is the focus on beginnings. And I think that for flash fiction in particular, a really good beginning can get you a long way. And <clears throat> particularly for world building, I think that that opening sentence again is a place where you can really get get a lot of work done. And I have an example of a um, of a world building story that I really love. The opening sentence it's um, Charlie Jane Anders, and uh, the story is Margot and Rosalind, and um, it was part of Tor's Nevertheless She Pers Persisted series that they that they had online a while back. And the opening sentence is. The doorbell rings as she's giving the brain its nutrient bath, um, which is a great opening sentence because it sort of establishes some of the speculative element for the world. It grabs your attention because it's interesting, it's different. Um, it starts with something that people do have experience of, which is sort of the idea of a doorbell ringing and, and you know, answering the door, but then it quickly moves away from the sort of the mundane and into the interesting speculative element that, that Charlie Jane has going in the story. Um, and it continues from there. It's an excellent, it's got some excellent world building elements to it. Um, beginnings also sort of let the reader know that they're in good hands and it sort of sets the tone for the story and, and helps you um, sort of guide the reader into, into the story that, and the world that you have. Um, and so, um, so I think that in Flash, um, one of the things one of the things you can do is try to balance all of these different elements. And um, for me, world building is more of a background element usually for Flash. It's not my main focus. I can think of ways that you could have the world building be the core of the story, but I think it is harder to actually generate that sort of moment of change that makes something feel like a complete story rather than you're setting the scene for something longer. Um, so when we were organizing this talk, this was a section that was a little bit harder for me because unlike idea and perspective, which are the things that are my real go-to things in a flash story, um, world building for me is an element that I really enjoy that needs to be there, but it's almost never my focal point. So. Um, I am now going to turn it back over to Tina and let her talk a little bit about structure. Yay, and I'm very excited because Carolyn graciously let me talk about my favorite thing at all to wrap up this whole talk, which is structure. <laughs> because honestly, I think one of the most kind of fun and playful and interesting and exciting things that sometimes that you can do with Flash is, is all the stuff with interesting structure. Um, it is, this is what I'm talking about when I say interesting structure. I'm talking about all the flash fiction that comes in the form of, you know, a grocery list, a Reddit post, a recipe, texts. Again, things that might not look, work at a, as a full length book, but they can be just right for a very, very short story. It can also be a helpful way to structure a story if you're stuck. Um, if you're, you know, you're trying to come up with something new and you're like, well, you know, top three apps that the, that the written by my zombie boss might give you a way into a new story because now you have a structure to follow. You got to come up with what each one of those apps are. The caution, of course, when you're doing an interesting, fun structure is you still have to have a story. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing I see when I see uh, stories like this that don't work is that they've, the author might not have remembered um, to think about the process of trying to make it feel like something is changing. Uh, so, you know, something, something still needs to change. There's still, in general, all roles are made to be broken. There needs to be a feeling of movement and change to a story. And this can be hard if your structure is something like, say, a found list, a grocery list. You know, presumably if you have a grocery list that the person wrote all at once, that is done. There is no structure, there is no change. So you have to say, well, how could it change? Well, what if somebody walked away and came back to it and wrote new things? What if your revealing of the world grew as you saw what they were putting on their grocery list? Oh, it's, you know, it starts with saltines, but it ends with, you know, alien onesies. You know, it's, it's, if things change, that can be how the, 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 uh, the change happens. Um, so one example that for this one is Amy Peaky recently had a story on Daily SF called The Search History of Elspeth Adair, age 11. 
and it is written as a Google search history. So again, if you if you have a thing that's a list, like I am, I look for A, I look for B, I look for C. You have to, you can't just have a list of funny words. There has to be a story in there. And so she and she does in about three hundred words. She really gets a story in there as the character's knowledge. You could see the character's knowledge growing with every new term that she searches, and by the end. You can even see her make a decision and she does that all through what the searches do so she, there's still a story there the story is coming in the gaps between the list items it's coming in the spaces that we don't see it's coming in in the lacunae that the the reader has to fill in and again to me as a writer that's exciting that idea that you're kind of playing with what's there on the page and what's not on the page as well i just it, it's it's really fun to play with um you can figure out a way to modify the structure so it's less static. So maybe, for example, you're doing a recipe, but you're going to intercut it with someone making the recipe and how it does or doesn't go to plan. Um, I've seen a number of stories like this that, uh, that tend to be very interesting. Um, and then another exciting thing that you could do, <laughs> you can consider what is unique to the structure you've chosen that can work thematically with your story. So both both Carolyn and I have written choose your own adventure stories here. So I'm just gonna I I'm gonna talk about Carolyn's for a moment embarrass her, but she wrote this really great story and I'm sorry Carolyn, it is called the <laughs> The interplanetary. <laughs> it is uh, 17 words long, which is why no one can remember the title. It is Welcome to the Interplanetary Oh, I can't even remember the title. <laughs> Welcome to the medical clinic at the interplanetary relay station. Hours since the last patient death, zero. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, it, so that is, it's a choose your own adventure flash, but it deals with choice as the theme of the flash. So thematically, the, the, the structure and the story are working together because, uh, Carolyn's story, which I will just explain for her while she sits there, is all about how really when you're dealing with predatory healthcare insurance, there are no actual, nothing, your choices don't matter. There's no good way out. And so set, styling it as a choose your own adventure works structurally, works thematically to show, to, to, to make the story really sort of use its structure to its full benefit. And that to me is a very exciting thing. Um, on the flip side, uh, list stories and fun structures can also be a really good uh, route for comedy, of course. And we've all seen so many McSweeney's uh, articles that are that often kind of follow this structure. And sometimes you can the comedy can come just from the disparity between you you have the juxtaposition between maybe something a serious list structure and the the funny way in which it's being interpreted. Now. Uh, Structure in flash stories, of course, it doesn't have to be an interesting, like uh, a list or Reddit or, you know, it doesn't have to be the most unique thing that you've ever thought of. There are other, other interesting structures that you can do uh, that, are, that can be really interesting in flash as well. Uh, and so, for example, one I wanted to use for that is there's a story by S.B. Divya on Lightspeed called Binaries, which uses just a very simple structure of, um, showcasing scenes in a character's life arranged by year. So it's like year one, a couple sentences, year three, a couple sentences. But the interesting thing about the story is this character ends up being like 400, 500 years old by the course of the story as it goes into the future. And so she's used this to have a very epic scope of showing, of, of using that structure to um, gets an incredibly epic scope into a flash story where normally you wouldn't really have a good way to tell about 500 years of a character's life. And setting up a simple kind of structure like that can also be a thing that can work really well for you. And again, I think you're filling in gaps with, you know, what happens in these years between. So a lot of that is making, you know, these 700, 800 words are, are really working hard for you when you're, when you're thinking about all the things that you're not writing in them. Uh, one last example that Carolyn mentioned earlier, uh, Carolyn coined the term flash mash a while back when we were writing a lot of flash. Uh, and, and as Carolyn said earlier, we both kind of started out writing very short and tried to kind of figure out how to write longer. Well, one way that you can figure out how to write longer is by adding multiple sections of, of, of sh very short stories together. Um, 
And so one, one good example of this was a, a, a wonderful award-winning story from last year, but Fenderson Jolly Clark's uh, The Secret Lives of the Nine Negro Teeth of George Washington, which ran on Fireside. The whole story is set up telling each story of those nine teeth. And so we have nine flashes, really. I, you know, I don't know how he personally conceived of it to write of it, but when you look at it, I mean, as a reader, it's like nine very short stories. But once you've built them, put them together, you know, it, cre it accretes. And so you're able to have build those stories together to tell a, not, a very powerful story about racism that's, that's powerful in this sort of scope that it's able to cover. So it's yet another way that you can take Flash and think about what it can do at even a, a, another length. A Flash is a longer form even, which is uh, kind of an interesting and another, yet another exciting way to think about structure with Flash. So anyway, I will, those were our main kind of six points. I'm going to throw it back to you, Carolyn, to, to kind of wrap things up for us and uh, see us on out. All right. So, um, so as Tina was saying, we sort of arranged our, our talk on flash fiction into some of the different elements that you could focus on as you're writing a flash story. One of the things that people often find challenging about flash fiction is sort of whittling things down until it is short enough to actually count as flash, which, you know, people will have different definitions of. But often, if you're sort of thinking about this is going to be a story where I really focus on the voice, or this is a story where I'm really going to focus on highlighting this one idea, can help people who tend to write longer get things down to flash length. Um, in the end, a lot of flash stories are obviously going to have most of these elements. Um, the focus may be one thing or another, but you're still going to have, you know, characters and an idea, and you'll have an arc where something changes. There will be some kind of setting, although it might be very minimal. Um, and making everything sort of come together in a way that is satisfying for the reader. Um, you know, as with all writing advice, we threw out a lot of suggestions. Tina and I come from very different perspectives, so some of the things that we've said might connect with some of you. Some of the things, you know, I say may connect with some people. Tina might say things that connect more strongly with other people, depending on what your process is. Um, you know, just kind of Try things out. If they don't work, they don't work. You know, they're all just sort of suggestions for things to think about or things that you can try. Um, but um, I really do love teaching with Tina because we have such opposite perspectives on so many things that, uh, that I feel that it really gives people a lot of breadth in terms of ways you could look at writing process. So um, that is our craft talk on Flash.